ladies uh, and gentlemen, dear colleagues and uh, patients. My name is Ben Pfeiffer. I'm coming from Switzerland, and we are known to be always on time, so we want to start on time. Matter of fact, in Switzerland, you can set your watches according to our train system. Not sure whether I should be that proud of that or anyway. I am proud to be here. I was invited to come and speak about our experience of the last uh, 15 years at a uh, non-for-profit cancer clinic in Switzerland called the Esculap Clinic. The subject for today is our integrative treatment approach to metastatic cancer. 20,000 people die of cancer every day. This translates to 8 million deaths every year, half a million of which are Americans. At the beginning of the last century, one person out of 20 would get cancer. In the 1940s, it was one out of every 16 people. In the 1970s, one person out of 10. Today, one person out of three gets cancer in the course of their life. Over one million Americans are diagnosed with a new cancer every year. All these people suddenly plunge into a dark tunnel that will dramatically change their life for many years to come. Faced with an apparently endless chain of medical tests, examinations, second opinions, medications, new tests, surgical operations, support therapies, and follow-up checks, they find themselves at the complete mercy of the disease. While in that tunnel, each patient feeds an immense medical apparatus that employs hundreds of thousands of people and generates millions and millions of dollars for the medical and pharmaceutical industries. From research laboratories to medical schools, from prevention clinics to worldwide drug sales. Today, the cancer medical apparatus is so large and expensive that it needs its patients in order to survive just as much as the patients need the apparatus. But to modern oncology, cancer still remains a mystery. And uh, that is also reflected in uh, cancer statistics globally. Your country is not an exception. Incidence rates of uh, cancer is going up constantly. And at least for metastatic disease, there's not real progress made. Cancer patients uh, with metastatic disease still have to fear the same fate as it was 30 years ago. In the uh, United Kingdom, we have about 350,000 new cases per year and uh, 165,000 cancer patients will die. 50% of all cancers are from lung, intestine, breast, and prostate cancer. Over the decades, there was about a 20% increase uh, of survival or decrease of cancer deaths. Um, but that took 40 years to achieve that. 50% of all cancer patients today can expect to survive five years. The standard treatments that we are still clinging on is uh, the surgical removal of the cancer, of the visible aspect of the disease, radiation treatment, and uh, combinations thereof, operation and radiation, chemotherapy and radiation, chemotherapy by itself. Nevertheless, 50% upon diagnosis are declared initially non-curable because they are already metastasized. Now, for those, there is not much improvement in the statistics and there is not much improvement with regard to therapy options and outcome. If we look at cancer survival, it's clearly depending on the stage of the disease. If you have stage one and two, well, disease is usually well controlled for quite some time. And the five-year survival for breast cancer, for example, today can be around 80 to 85 percent. For prostate cancer, it's similar. But when you come to this 
stage four metastatic disease, things look different. There we have only about 10% who will enjoy a five-year lifespan after diagnosis for breast and also for prostate cancer. Stage four metastatic disease has very limited therapeutic options. There is second line chemotherapy, palliative radiation treatment, palliative hormone therapy, immune therapy. Once the disease is progressing, third line chemotherapy is often applied. Palliative radiation is repeated. Second line hormonal treatment is being attempted. And that goes on towards experimental treatments, inclusion in clinical trials. But in the end, all these treatments, in particular second and third line chemotherapy, have very small benefit for the patient. The quality of life usually suffers. The toxic treatment effects are taking out stamina, well-being, and hope from the patient. The gain is often measured only in weeks. And much of that time is being spent at hospitals or physician offices to get this treatment. That could be spent more wisely with the families. This situation was basically the reason for us to deal with other possible even better treatment approaches to metastatic disease. Looking at metastatic cells, at metastatic cancer cells, they're very smart biological entities. They have learned to use what's called escape mechanism to really trick our immune system that should be dealing with them in the first place. They have also developed a strategy to escape toxic effects of chemotherapy and radiation, and even other treatments, like targeted treatments with antibodies. They have one goal, and that is to stay alive, to multiply, to grow a colony, even then if it would kill the host. With that in mind, we have learned over the last 15 years what to combine to get a little handle on those smart cells, metastatic cells, to be more effective against them. And our integrative approach is not criticizing conventional treatment at all. In the contrary, we try to use what's best on that side and combine with what we know can work on the other side. This is what I call integrative oncology. Now, what are we using? Leading edge conventional treatments wherever we can. Surgery, even chemotherapy protocol. For example, if a patient is gasping for air because of a big bronchial carcinoma, it would take too long with our strategy, the patient wouldn't survive. So we give him chemotherapy at the very beginning to shrink that tumor. But we know when chemotherapy ceiling dose is reached, the tumor will come back. So in that time, we add other measures to have more success. Those other measures are simple change of dietary, inter uh, change, simple change of diet, dietary interventions, physical exercise protocols, psycho-oncology measures, antioxidative treatments, anti-inflammatory treatments, angiogenesis inhibition, meaning trying to inhibit the growth of new vessels into the tumor or into the metastases so that they cannot thrive as well. Immune treatments, modulation and support, detoxification treatments, taking out toxic substances that we know will maintain inflammation, will maintain cancer growth. And last but not least, phytotherapy, all brought together for one goal, 
to get a long-term control of cancer. We are not trying to claim cure. Even with cancer patients that I have that were metastatic 16 years ago to the lung and to the bone, I would never say you got rid of your cancer. No, I think they still are cancer patients, but they have controlled their cancer very well. We cannot even measure it. We cannot find it. Quality of life must be improved with those measures and shouldn't be disturbed. And in the end, survival should be better. If you look at dietary interventions uh, as one of the, uh, this group, here are some general recommendations. I feel, and we have written it in the first textbook on integrative oncology, that there is not really a cancer diet, but there is several approaches to dietary measures that in certain circumstances could be beneficial. In the general recommendations, we always look at uh, overweight uh, patients and ask them to get down to a normal weight by, if they are able and capable to do, by physical exercise and by reducing their caloric intake. We want to avoid bad nutrition, so no fast food. And a simple uh, rule of thumb is instead fats, and uh, in particular bad fats, uh, try fresh veg vegetables and fruits. But there's one diet that I want to at least make you aware of called ketogenic diet. Maybe some of you will know already. We measured two parameters in metastatic cancer patients. One is called TKTL1, transketolase 1. The other one is called APO10. If these two are high, elevated, we usually look at a possible intervention with ketogenic diet. For those of you who are interested in the handout, you will find a little bit more to that, or you can call the number or send us a mail, send you all the literature towards this. We know with that diet, reducing caloric intake from carbohydrates, reducing carbohydrate intake maybe to 15, 20 gram a day, not 75 to 100 gram as it's usually done, and replacing the calories by good fats or with good fats and oils, vegetable oils and fats, uh, this diet will reduce the availability of glucose for a cancer colony. And most of you know cancer cells are having quite a different metabolic uh, situation than normal cells. They do what is called aerobic glycolysis, meaning they are not burning sugar down to CO2 and water. They are stopping at the glycolysis level and ferment sugar. That means they produce much less ATP from one mole of sugar or glucose, and therefore they are graving for sugar. And that graving we can somehow curtail with reducing the availability. We have tried to go to the extreme with that and have used artificial coma, where we reduce the sugar level to a comatose level, 40 milligram percent and less. Normally it's 80 to 120. But that doesn't work for some reason. Chronically less sugar intake and more ketone bodies in, in your blood through ketogenic diet seems to be better. I have shown you here in that picture three PET scan images. PET stands for positron emission tomography of a patient with malignant melanoma. And what is given to that patient to make those scan images is FDG, a radioactive marked sugar molecule. And you see before the uh, ketogenic diet was started, this black area here is uptake of FDG. And before 
the diet was uh, given, we call that 100% uptake. Uh, when the patient was on the ketogenic diet for a couple of months, two months only, you see the FTG uptake, meaning the activity of the melanoma metastases, was much less, 74%, already after two months on the diet. When he stopped the diet, this patient, the FDG comes back, or FDG DUR, that is the dose uptake ratio, comes back to almost the same level uh, as before. So for certain cancers that have high TK, TL1, and high APO10, this diet could be attempted and could be providing benefit. The next... Uh, part that we uh, are adding for our patients is antioxidative, anti-inflammatory, and angiogenesis inhibiting treatment. We use curcumin, artemisinin, convolvulus arvensis extract, and imuprost for that. Now, curcumin is known to many uh, practitioners for its anti- cancer uh, genesis effect. That means it inhibits cancer growth and inhibits, it inhibits cancer genesis. And there's plenty of uh, proof in PubMed literature. We know we give it in three gram and more to reduce inflammation. There's also plenty of literature citations. And last but not least, we know it can reduce the new building or development of small blood vessels that the tumor itself and the metastases need to thrive. So we use all three of those features. Artemisinin has a similar uh, profile. It also works against cancer development itself. It has anti-inflammatory and it also has anti-angiogenesis effects. Convolvulus sorvensis is a bind weed, a very simple weed in the yard, endemic in Northern America. It has direct anti-angiogenesis effects. It has plenty of proteoglycanes in it that inhibit the growth of vessels. It's a simple experiment. A tumor is put into the uh, egg of a chicken, and uh, this implantation along this membrane is uh, without treatment with convolvulus or Vensis extract. On the other side, you see it with treatment. And here you see this tumor implant with convolvulus or Vensis put into the chicken egg is not having access to blood supply. So the tumor will not thrive. This one will thrive. That is what we hope for patients uh, use as well. Immuprost is a automolecular preparation that we use with uh, good antioxidative effects. It was measured at uh, our MIT in Switzerland in Zurich. The uh, antioxidative properties were um, similar to that of a high dose of uh, vitamin C, of a high dose of vitamin E and of glutathione. It is manufactured in a special galenic, uh, with a special galenic uh, technology, time-release capsule, so we can put many ingredients in a small envelope of uh, uh, lipids. That envelope is protecting the individual ingredients and releases them into the gut at different times. So therefore, we could put selenium and vitamin C in there. There's no chemical interaction because they are released at different times in the gut. These are the ingredients list. For those who are interested, that's easy to get on the internet. And this is what we use it for, for chemo prevention and for treatment with this uh, and this dose, respectively. The next uh, column is immune modulation. Here we think is... Uh, a lot of work to be done for classical oncology in the future. The normal treatment for a metastatic patient is 
only guided by looking at leukocyte count by most of the oncologists. Differential blood build is a rare situation. Nobody really looks at that. If there's enough leukocytes over 2,000 or 2,500, we give the next chemotherapy. But what we do is that toxic treatment is very long lasting. We are reducing important cytotoxic T cells. We are reducing the total colony of lymphocytes down to four or five percent of white cells, which should be 30 percent of white cells. And we leave the patient with this. After radiation, we have checked whole head radiation. For one year, you will see low lymphocyte count. If you have no lymphocytes, how are you doing your surveillance of remaining cancer cells? So that is something classical oncologists will learn because patients will demand that they look at that as well. Our immune support is directed against or, or towards uh, supporting NK cells that we do with BioBrand, which I will talk a bit about, and uh, Simus to get more lymphocytes into the peripheral bloodstream. A uh, second column is uh, to the use of uh, dendritic cell vaccination, means the classical tumor vaccine um, done with immunization of the patient with his own or her own dendritic cells. Let's look at BioBrand quickly. And K cell function is impaired in cancer patients. If you go from beginning of cancer, you will not see much change, but if you go towards far progressed cancer, you will have always lymphocyte down, lymphocytopenia, and you will have all, always NK cells missing in number and in function. If you look at healthy and at 100% and look at these cancer entities with uh, beginning of metastatic disease, then you see how far it is reduced. Our goal is to bring that back up there to give patients a better chance to fight their cancer cells. This is the product we are using, made by Daiwa in uh, Japan and uh, distributed worldwide. Compared to other arabinoxalan compounds, this uh, biobrand has a superior effect on NK cell number and uh, function. If you look at this picture on the right, you see some cancer cells, and here the small ones, the NK cells. What BioBrand is capable of doing very well, it increases the number of so-called cytotoxic granula on the surface of these NK cells. When these NK cells dock onto the big cancer cell, in these granulas there is what's called perforance. These are chemical substances that can basically dissolve the outer lipid layer of the cancer cell membrane and create a leakage of the cell. When there is enough opening created by the perforance, the cancer cell will die. On the left-hand side, you see uh, the so-called conjugation uh, number, means how many of those NK cells will dock onto a cancer cell before and after use of BioBrand. You see that this is increased fourfold, usually, the docking of NK cells towards the cancer cells with BioBrand. BioBrand not only increases uh, those granula, it also has unexplained so far a direct anti-tumor effect that can be shown, has been shown in mice experiments. Down here, the upper curve is basically control animals, oh sorry, control animals tumor volume over time. These are experiments where a mouse gets in, in, uh, planted a tumor that we know is growing well in the mouse, and then you measure the tumor volume in the mouse after so and so many weeks or days. The lower curve shows you that same um, tumor under treatment with BioBrand. And here, uh, the immune arm is controlled. That means the uh, immune cells were taken down in those mice. So we know 
this effect is not coming through the immune system. It must be a direct effect on the cancer. Uh, we have measured that many, many times over in our uh, prostate cancer and breast cancer patient uh, group and have seen that consistently with uh, two gram per day, the NK cell number and function increases from baseline. 200%, 300%, depending a bit on the dose of usage. Patients who do not achieve that, like this gentleman here, they usually have progressing disease. So indirect, we see an, a proof that uh, NK activation is very important to have a immune system that can attack cancer and can help prevent progression of the disease. This is a publication from Japan where they showed that effect it is also true for other cancers. 205 cancer patients with progressive metastatic disease, stage three and four were here included. And the people looked at two years survival only. The bio brand group had 52% uh, or 54%, sorry, 54% survival at two years. The control group, they were not treated with Biobran, only 34%. And if you looked at the NK activity initially, then you saw that this difference was even a bit bigger. Patients who came into the study with only 20% or less NK function, they had, due to the Biobran treatment, a huge increase in survival, 42% while the control group of those patients had only 12%. So that shows us that not only does that work in the laboratory, in the petri dish, and in the mice, it actually works at the patient bedside. The uh, second part of our immune support program is dendritic cell vaccination. And here is one slide that shows you simplistically what it involves. Most of the time we do what's called a leukapheresis. That is basically a machine where your blood is running through and the, most of the blood components are returned back to the, through the return line to the patient. Only part of the white cell called Buffy code is being used for the lab and that is that, that, is that fraction where most of the monocytes are in. So if we have enough monocytes collected, then we put them in a culture chamber where they are stimulated with certain growth factors for about seven days. And they go through maturation stages here. And finally, from this round cell with a big nucleus, a dendrit uh, develops. Sometimes, if available, we use the patient's own tumor material to prime, that's what it's called, that colony of dendritic cells, to basically show them how the enemy looks, provide them with tumor antigen from tumor cells, and then they are pulsed or primed twice during their uh, lab period of seven days. And if we don't have this tumor material, then we use a proprietary polypeptide antigen. That is an important part of our program, I believe. A colleague of uh, mine from Harvard, Professor Marcus Frank, has come up with that concoction because he has found that so-called cancer stem cells are very hard to attack with uh, our treatment methods that we have. And even DC dendritic cell vaccination, if not using this polypeptide mix will not address those stem cells. So you will get an immune response against metastatic cancer, but cancer stem cells will remain and you are not able to take care of the whole population because they are extremely smart, will start a colony again after uh, three to four weeks. So we feel that with that program using a polypeptide antigen that has a 
possibility to address cancer stem cells as well, that we are having an advantage for the patient. In the end, after priming is done successfully three, four times, we use this mature DC cell and inject it intradermally. If we have enough, millions and millions, we also inject it intravenously, but usually intradermally, and do that every three to four weeks, measuring the immune response in the patient. Detox is uh, often used, and sometimes it has a bad in, uh, intonation, but uh, we think it's very important to make that a part of our protocol. It is estimated that about 80 to 90 percent of all cancer is caused by environmental factors, mostly petrochemical uh, toxins and heavy metals. So we need to have something that takes that out of the body to be successful. Long, wrong lifestyle choices, smoking tobacco, drinking, and having a lot of recreational drugs is certainly not helpful, but I think the main part comes from here. Um, we have a very simple program. We ask our patients to drink at least two liters of ionized water. We like to have a pH up 8.5 to 9. Uh, we are supplementing this detoxification phase with multivitamin and multimineral. We are doing some intravenous chelation therapy, also with a proprietary mix to reduce heavy metals and other toxic substances by improving liver excretion into the bile and kidney, enabling the kidney to uh, excrete into the urine. And we do have a homemade Swiss invention, a detox me, which uh, is basically a activated zeolite that has been developed by our MIT Institute in Zurich by ETH, it's called. And here uh, I will show you the uh, uh, product. Um, we have proof that this can remove not only lead, cadmium, mercury, nickel, and arsenic very reliably, it also takes out aflatoxins and various pesticides out of the intestinal tract. It's given orally, it's a sachet, doesn't taste good, but with some water and a good juice, it's uh, bearable. Uh, this was also used for my Asian patient. After the uh, nuclear accident in Japan, many of my patients from um, Taipei and from Jakarta came with extremely high cesium uh, intoxications from seafood most likely, they had 70 times, 80 times the allowed level of cesium-134 in their blood. We gave them two months this product, Detox Me, which was, by the way, used when Chernobyl accident happened in the 80s. They poured that over the whole nuclear factory at that time. And their cesium levels declined towards normal very quickly. So it does do what ETH Zurich or ETH Zurich uh, claims and promised. Uh, but not only does it remove toxins, when those particles are activated and made very small, nanometer area, those particles are, they become biologically active. They are not inert lava stone anymore, but they have activation clearly measurable of the gut-associated immune system. They increase B cells, T cells, and K cells through activation of the gut-associated immune system. The last one, and that is uh, a big part of our treatment program, is phytotherapy. There is uh, lots to be said about phytotherapy and um, many People are using uh, phyto, that means plant-derived extracts to treat cancer or to support immune system. We have learned that a couple of uh, uh, products are very helpful. One is uh, called Imusan that we buy from a company in Holland, Indole 3-carbinol, 
then we make our own MCP modified citrospectin and we make our own um, convolvus arvensis extract, which is called s -club CA statin. We have also seen that for breast and prostate cancer, those four ingredients are very helpful, and I will show you a little bit more to that uh, in just a minute. Imusan is a herbal concoction where there's 15 herbs extracted. It has been shown that it is helpful uh, for treatment of metastatic cancer. And uh, here is what we found in the laboratory. Inhibition of uh, cell division in vitro means in the Petri dish, when you put Imusan into the Petri dish nutritional media. It, ch it changes the, uh, or normalizes the P53 gene, that is the gene that is responsible for apoptosis, and it increases uh, NK cell activity. Here is a simple experiment that uh, was done with a uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer colony. Uh, in the nutritional media, 200 micrograms of imuzan extract was added. And you see here on that side uh, is the survival of the cancer cell at 4 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. On the control side, cancer cells propagate and grow greatly. On this side, it's getting sparse, and they are actually dying off. Now, that's a petri dish. That's not a patient. Then, as you know from the workbench lab, you go to the animal experimentation. These are mice that got Imusan uh, in addition uh, after they were basically receiving an implant with uh, breast cancer. And after a certain time, uh, we measured the uh, tumor volume. And you see on the upper part, this is the tumor volume in those mice, breast cancer volume with or under immunosan treatment of the mice. This is the untreated mice. We found that there's roughly a 50% inhibition within the two months of uh, those uh, uh, lab tests. Uh, indoles recarbonol, a product that has plenty of literature behind it, not the product, but the substance itself, there is a clear proof that it can um, be helpful with prostate, breast, and endometrial cancer. It reduces a hydroxyestrone in the blood. It changes estradiol to estriol, a weaker estrogen. It inhibits prostate and breast cancer cell growth. And um, it works when those cells have become what's called hormonal refractory, meaning patients who have gone through hormonal uh, treatment and they're not responding anymore may have a benefit from indoles recarbonyl treatment. As you know, these are the sources. Uh, brassica uh, vegetables are full of that compound. Now, phytotherapy for cancer looks very simple, but unfortunately, it's not. And one rule we have also learned is that more is not always good. This patient here, for example, if you add this all up, has received almost 100 capsules and tablets and potions per day. Uh, this is probably too much, and uh, even for the toughest patients to, to bear. We feel that you can do with three groups, actually, for breast and prostate cancer. This one here is our standard uh, being used for prostate cancer, prostasol, our escolab cytosterol mix, which is kind of a booster of this one, and curcumin, up to 6 gram, 5 gram per day. This is our baseline uh, for breast cancer patients, and this down here we use for other solid tumors, but also as an addition for breast and prostate cancer. Prostazol, I will show you very quickly, is a uh, substance uh, or a product with nine medicinal herbs, including a, a lignan cocktail from, uh, called Linum Life from 
linseed oil and including a biocurcumin complex. We have tested this many, many times and we still find that this product also made by this Dutch company is still the best. Even if we tried to attempt our own, it wasn't as effective in the lab, so we are still using that. This is a publication that we did in May 2006, uh, showing that prostasol indeed inhibits uh, cancer growth of prostate cells in a dose-dependent manner. We know that it downregulates PSA expression, and we know that it sensitizes prostate cancer cells uh, to heat and radiation. Um, this is one patient that I want to introduce quickly to you because it's our presenter or the most presentable patient. 58 years old, came to me when I was still in the U.S. Uh, to Sloan Kettering uh, in, from Venezuela, and he had a treatment-resistant bone pain. He had a PSA elevated to 87. He was found to have uh, prostate cancer with bone metastases. He was put on uh, combined uh, anti-hormonal treatment, but uh, his PSA was only responding for about one and a half years, then it went up to 2,800, bad bone pain, tumor anemia. He was at the end of his rope and said, I don't want chemotherapy that we proposed at that time to him. Or a year later or so, I started with him when I was at the University of Kentucky, I started with him on a precursor of prostasol that was called PC Spes at the time. And uh, it didn't even have that name yet. And we added curcumin that we made ourselves at the university. And we added a Immuprost uh, similar uh, concoction that however was consisting of 20 different pills, selenium, vitamin C, zinc, calcium, and, 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 and. It was a terrible cocktail actually but the patient did well with it and uh, was outliving all predictions. And here at the uh, next slide, I show you his uh, bone scan, which was full of uh, black spots, the axis full, the rib cage full, even the uh, uh, skull full of metastases. He had a significant tumor anemia, was not able to uh, walk anymore when he first came, uh, but his PSA responded very well, coming down within two years' time to uh, an um, unmeasurable level. And uh, two years later, his bone scan only showed some remaining residual uh, metastases here in the left-hand side. The tumor anemia was vanishing, or was vanished, and there was no pain anymore. He had good life quality. Today, uh, 14, that's 16 years later, his PSA is below one, bone lesions cannot be seen, has no pain, and the patient is really active, still doing his business. So that is an exceptional case, but it's not the only one. Uh, the last three years, we asked an independent statistician company, medical statistician company, to look at all of our data. There is about 10,000 patients with prostate cancer over the last 10 years that were looked through and about 3,500 breast cancer patients. And they came up with an idea to interview all these patients. They wrote to 3,000 prostate cancer patients, to 1,200 breast cancer patients, and the responses were then gathered and the patients were interviewed. The outcome of that study, of that retrospective study for prostate cancer, I want to show you here. 494 patients uh, with metastatic prostate cancer responded, some of which had received the standard protocol, others had received additional treatment with our uh, MCP, which is modified citrospectin and imusan and other uh, components. Uh, and the observation period was basically 2000 to 2013. We got some money from a very wealthy patient to do that study. The results, 388 patients continue on the protocol of these 494, 141 of those have progressive disease, uh, and 106 of, 106 of 494 have died due to progressive disease. Here are the patient's data with regard to PSA, to tumor volume, 
and pain and so on. But what's, what's important is this line here. Uh, we have 28 patients among those that responded to the interview that are still alive today for more than 10 years with double metastatic disease, meaning either bone and lung, bone and lymphatic system, lymphatic system and lung, which is much rarer than the other two combinations. And among those 28 patients, eight are alive 14 years with double metastases and two are alive 16 years. So that stimulated us to continue with uh, the quest to find a better solution for metastatic cancer. And I think uh, since the side effect profile is very limited, there's a bit of dyspepsia in the first three weeks when they start on the protocol. There's some, for prostate cancer, some breast nipple soreness. And there's maybe a slightly increased risk for uh, deep venous thrombosis because of the high phytoestrogen content, but we had only 0.6% calculated by that statistician company for this event in, in our population. So very low. We are not even sure whether it's coincidental or caused by it. Now, here as a last slide, I show you the standard treatment curve or survival curve for patients with this disease under standard treatment, then a survival curve, best treatment including immunological DC vaccination with Prostvac, that's a new vaccine that is gonna be available industrial next year probably. And then we compared that and just overlaid our own survival curve. And uh, I show you that one now, and we are not too bad. I hope that many of our patients can smile like this. I thank you much for your attention.